Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and tell them I sent you. This week's podcast is brought to you by The Great Courses. I love learning. This is why I'm a big fan of The Great Courses. These are audio and video lecture series taught by top professors and experts. I recently watched Mysteries of Modern Physics, Time, hosted by physicist Sean Carroll, author and professor from Caltech, and you might remember him from his Story Collider podcast earlier this year about how he turned down jobs from Stephen Hawking twice. If you're curious about the science Sean does, know this course is perfect for that. He covers what we know about what time is, how the arrow of time works, all that good stuff. You can check out this lecture and others too with a special offer. Order from eight of their best-selling courses, including Sean Carroll's, at up to 80% off the original price for a limited time. Order today. Go to thegreatcourses.com slash stories. That's thegreatcourses.com slash stories. A science story, huh? Is NYU scientist the... I felt it. I felt it. Right. I was so and happy. And I just thought, well... I had figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Nir Ashri. It was recorded in September 2015 at Union Hall in Brooklyn. I stand before you as a victim of milk-related trauma. It happened when I was an undergraduate at uh, Cambridge University in England. I I loved studying at Cambridge uh, for many reasons. One reason that even as a freshman, or as a fresher, we called it there, you had your own room, and it was my little sanctuary. It wasn't anything special. It just had a bed and a desk and a wardrobe for my clothes and another wardrobe where there was a sink. And that was really useful because I could brush my teeth whenever I wanted to. Even better, I could pee whenever I wanted to, especially on Sunday mornings when the toilets in the dorms were inevitably covered with vomit from partying the night before, so it was really useful. I could also wash my dishes, although I actually only had one dish, which was my uh, cereal, plastic cereal bowl, because like a good American boy, for breakfast, I always had cereal. The, the one problem with my little island of self-sufficiency is the milk. I couldn't keep the milk in the room. I kept it in the communal fridge down the hall. But there were only uh, five floor mates uh, that I had, so, and the kitchen wasn't used very much. So I would buy these pint-sized cartons of milk, put it in the fridge, and I was really happy for about three weeks because then somebody began to steal my milk. And that really upset me. Um, first of all, the principle of it. I hope we can all agree that stealing is bad. Yeah? And then there's the other thing, that I, sometimes this person would steal the last carton of milk I had, which meant the next morning I couldn't have cereal for breakfast. And that really, really annoyed me. So I, I, I wasn't sure what to do. I started you know, really simple, like grade school. So first I put my name on the milk, you know, near. That didn't do anything. And then I thought, okay, maybe I need a little bit clearer. I wrote, this milk belongs to near. You know? <laughs> as, you know, as if that would make a difference. You know? I was delusional. The milk was being stolen. Uh, then I, I, <laughs> I was then moved to a little more sophisticated approach. I was making ethical pleas. So I'd, I'd, I'd write notes, um, and they'd have different things on them. One I started was just, you know, stealing is wrong. Um, <laughs> 
and then also I had stealing is against the Ten Commandments. I, I couldn't remember which one, so I gave myself a little leeway there. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, um, I also used, I think, Socrates proved that stealing is wrong. Um, didn't work. What I, the stealing continued. What I got was commentary on my notes. Um, for example, uh, well, on, it wasn't me, you know. Honest, it wasn't me, actually. Uh, I don't drink milk. M but my favorite was the only thing I'll ever steal is money. Uh, I li like some, someone with a future. Um, I, 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 did, I did try to do a little bit of graphology on that, but that's total pseudoscience, so, so it, it didn't take me far. The, the first rational thing I did was actually take out insurance, and in this case, insurance is buying long-life milk, the kind that you know is pasteurized with a, an atomic bomb or something, so that you can keep it in your room and it doesn't go bad until you open it. But th that was a problem, because A, that thing tastes terrible because it was pasteurized with an atomic bomb. And also, it's just the principle of it. I wanted my milk. And it may have to do with the fact that I wasn't best breastfed, but I needed the milk. <laughs> so then I started um, to think, you know, maybe, wait, I, I, I was, of course, beginning to panic, but then it hit me, wait, I'm studying science. I'm trying to become a physicist. I'm studying natural science. Let me use science to solve this problem. I started with a soft science, psychology. Every time I saw one of my... Uh, um, floor mates, I uh, would steer the conversation into a milk-based topic or use milk-based expression. So, for example, they say, oh, Nir, you had a long lab last night. I said, uh, yeah, I, I worked till the cows came home. Um, or, wow, that, that's an expensive shirt you've got on. Uh, oh, yeah, at the store, they milked me dry. Uh, and, of course, uh, don't cry over spilled milk. I use that all the time. Uh, but it didn't help. They didn't flinch. Not even a little, you know, no reaction, nothing. So, so I, had to, I had to collect more data. So then I began to simultaneously <laughs> stalk all five of my floor mates. Um, <laughs> Well, stalking might be a little strong word. It was more monitoring because they all studied different um, subjects. Uh, one was law, one was history, one was an engineer, uh, one was a philosopher. Um, and I was trying to find a, um, a correlation between their schedules and the theft of the milk, but, but I, I couldn't. The only thing I, I succeeded in doing is actually eliminating the, the fifth person who wasn't in fact, a student at all, it was a, a fellow, or, or here would be a faculty member. And I, I eliminated him very quickly by sprinkling talcum powder at his doorstop. So I realized he wasn't using the room, so it couldn't have been him who was stealing the milk. Um, but apart from that, I, I had no, no clues. So um, I said, okay, now I have to maybe get my hands dirty here, like a real experimentalist. After all, I'm studying to become a physicist, so maybe I can change the physical properties of the milk. I, so I went to the supermarket and I bought this green food coloring, you know, fluorescent kind of sci-fi like, and I poured it in the milk and it looked really weird. But it was perfectly, you know, drinkable. The taste wasn't changed at all. And it was great. For one week, no problem. Then what happened? Well, my, uh, the, the, the person who was stealing the milk figured out that I was drinking the milk, so it was safe to drink. So he could start stealing it again. So that didn't help me very much. So physics failed. Well, then I said, well, maybe chemistry, you know? Uh, I, I decided to squeeze lemon into the milk. And uh, that, uh, you know, makes it more acidic. It uh, curdles it. It precipitates the protein in the milk. And it worked great because the, the milk was terrible. You can't drink that stuff. Um, in fact, he couldn't drink that stuff. I couldn't drink that stuff. Uh, so stalemate. But I ended up just wasting milk. And so that, that wasn't uh, so productive. And, I, and I'm getting really exasperated, very, very upset. And by chance, my brother Gil comes to visit me. And I'm venting to him and I'm trying to explain all this, you know, how I'm being hounded by this thief and this. And I said, and, I, and, and I'm really, you know, getting worked up about it. And then I, I say, to, you know, finally I, say, I just say, I don't know what to do anymore, really. I've run out of all ideas. I mean, the only thing I can think of is to pee in the milk. And that was a beautiful moment. <laughs> Because my brother didn't laugh, he didn't scoff, he didn't, you know, mock me. He just looked at me and said, get a carton. I don't know if you know that 
50s movie. It's a French movie uh, called Rififi. It's a film noir. And the center of it is a jewel heist. 20 minutes, they break into a store, and there isn't a single sound. And it's super intense. And that's how I felt. <laughs> I get up, I go outside, I get a carton. I come back in. My brother stands up. We walk to the wardrobe where there's the sink. I open the wardrobe. I open the milk carton. At that point, I'd become really good at opening milk cartons in such a way that I could reseal them and it looked like they'd never been opened at all. My brother at that point drops his pants. Well, actually, he unzipped his fly and took out his penis. Uh, funny thing, I don't actually remember the penis. Because I'd seen it... I'd seen it on other occasions, but in this case, all I remember is handing him the glass and it filling up with this beautiful golden liquid. And it was right that it should be his urine, not mine. Not because I was afraid or I was ashamed, but because we were partners in crime and we were doing this together. I then empty the milk, partly, not the whole way, like a third, halfway. Then I pour the urine in there and we look. The appearance hasn't changed at all. <laughs> we reseal the carton and I take it outside. And now we wait. Maybe where physics and chemistry fail, biology would save us. First day, nothing happens. The milk is still there. Second day, still there. Third day, still there. Fourth day, it's gone. I never did find out who stole my milk, but I never had trouble with my milk again. Thank you very much. That was Nir Ashray. Nir is a professor of physics and biology at Yeshiva University. He received a BA and MA in natural sciences from Cambridge University and a PhD in physics from MIT. He was awarded grants from the National Science Foundation to support his research on the self-assembly of globular proteins. His articles have appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Physical Review Letters, and Crystal Growth and Design. In addition to his scientific publications, Nir has authored a novel and several short plays. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Union Hall for hosting the show, and to myself in college for never keeping anything in the fridge anyway. Thanks for listening. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out, and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.